Hi, and welcome to the Holly C Podcast, a show about expressing your brilliance with ease and flow. I'll show you how to take the woo-woo out of the clouds and apply it to real life for effortless action. This show is for world changers and future world changers. So if you know there's more to life and you're wondering what's next, this is your show. Hi, I'm Holly, your host. I am a speaker, author, dragon spirit guide, and a teacher of health and vitality and spirituality. Today's episode is unique because we have a very special guest. I only welcome guests onto my show when I believe they have something really amazing and powerful to share with listeners, and that would be really helpful and beneficial for you. So today's guest is a dear friend of mine. I've actually known him for 25 years. So please welcome Daniel Schmidt to the show. Dan, as I know him, and I won't say what his nickname was back in the day, Dan is an award-winning filmmaker. He is also a meditation teacher, a musician, and he runs the Samadhi Meditation Center in Ontario, Canada. Dan's film, Inner Worlds, Outer Worlds, which is about enlightenment, meditation, and the union with the true self, his film has won numerous awards, and it was the winner of the Award of Excellence for the International Film Festival for Spirituality, Religion, and Vision. Inner Worlds, Outer Worlds has been viewed by millions of people around the globe and has been translated into over 25 different languages. What's even more incredible is that Dan created and funded the film pretty much entirely by himself. He felt called to create this film. Now, I've known Dan for a long time, so I remember who he was before he became an award-winning filmmaker and meditation teacher. When I first met Dan, he was working as a sales associate at Multitech, the Canadian version of Best Buy. At that time, he did not know that he had a life-altering film with a very, very powerful message to share with the world. He didn't know that was inside him. When we first met, I also didn't know that I would have my own message and teachings to share with the world. I was working as a marketing assistant, cranking out brochures to promote legal conferences. Both of us were on a similar path where we were quote unquote unconscious. And for both of us, it took a severe health crisis to begin the awakening process. So I wanted to invite Dan on the show to share his story and his very powerful teachings about oneness, enlightenment, and realizing your brilliance. Dan's story shows how anyone can begin from anywhere and you can overcome huge setbacks to follow your soul's path and express your brilliance. If you care about the planet, if you care about peace and harmony, or if you're seeking more peace and harmony in your life, I invite you to tune in and listen to the entirety of today's show so that you can gain a greater awareness and understanding of how to release self-judgment and criticism and welcome more peace, harmony, compassion, and self-love into your life. So let's begin then. Welcome, Dan. Thank you. It's good to be here. And Dan is going to share with us a few exciting things. Um, one, we are going to give you guys the inside scoop of what it was like, quote unquote, before. So before Dan and I, either of us, were expressing our brilliance, what was going on? Because there's a unique uh, situation between the two of us that some of you may not know. Um, then Dan will share more about samadhi. This is absolutely transformational. It's a union with your true self, which is so important for expressing your brilliance, because how can you express your brilliance if you're not aware of your true brilliance? So, Dan, thank you again for joining us. Welcome, welcome. And uh, do you want to get started with sharing a bit about our history, like how we know each other? Sure. So, well, obviously, we, we lived together and 
We were partners for a period of life. And the evolution that both of us went through is very interesting. Who I was back then, I, how long ago was that? How we were in our 20s, so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was like it was a long time ago. ago. <laughs> yeah. It, it's really been quite a journey. And at the time we were together, um, you know, I was just pretty normal kind of person plugged into the matrix and, you know, working without any real knowledge of, of who I was beyond my condition structures. So, you know, at that time, I believed I was this Dan character. I believed I was this, this person who, you know, had two parents and, and, um, you know, had an interest in whatever, you know, and all, all the things that I had inherited from society, from teachers, from, you know, all of that conditioning. Um, at that time, I believed it was who I was. So, you know, when we were together, what was it that was together? You know, there was no real, um, I mean, you know, in, of course, there, there is a, an imminent eye or, you know, true consciousness that sort of shines through the personality at times. But um, at that time, for me, it, it wasn't aware of itself. So um, I think, you know, the, the journey for me has been a journey to start to recognize these, these patterns, these condition patterns that constitute Dan and to realize what is beyond those patterns. Yeah, I would have to agree because when I think back to that time, I was also doing that corporate grind thing. And you would even point it out to me that it seemed like I was in this pattern and I couldn't get out of the pattern. I just kept going to one job, you know, grinding it out, then quitting, and then going to another job, grinding it out, quitting, because I couldn't stand it, but I just kept repeating it. And I remember like when we were living together, just it seemed like both of us, there was like this spark inside, like I guess that would be what you're referring to, that true self wanting mm -hmm. to be expressed, but it was really clouded over by a lot of, ha of expectation on how we should live and just falling through on those patterns, just almost like a, a software on repeat. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And, and for me, those, those patterns really ramped up when I got into television, like working on Splat, the, the TV series, and those patterns of just constantly, it's almost irrelevant, really what they are. But in my case, it was sort of compulsive doing related to um, this sort of sublimated desire to survive, you know, like this primal instinct to make money and, you know, which became connected to this TV series. And yeah, it just became pathological. It just got to a point where it physically became a sickness inside. And um, literally my body was what shifted me out of that life you know, out of everything. Yeah, it was similar for me too, because while you were speaking before you mentioned the thing about money and survival, I was just sort of thinking back to that time. And that was what was sort of think crossing my mind too, was that there was this sense of um, like, yeah, there's that compulsion. Like for me, I had to stay in this job. I had to work in high tech. I had to make money. There was even though we were doing okay, like financially, I mean, we weren't rich or anything, but we weren't really poor either. But there was a sense of like, of like having this compulsion, like, oh my God, I can't get to, you know, whatever I'm trying to get to. And I, I can't be starving. Some, yeah, some sort of like reptilian survival instinct almost dominating what we were doing. Mm -hmm. It was yeah. making me sick too. Like both of us were literally working ourselves to be sick. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that feeling of 
not being fulfilled or not not having enough, not mm-hmm. being complete, is um, you know now when I look back at it, it 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 just is the activity of the ego structure. That's all an ego is is just this compulsive series of patterns of of grasping and. In Buddhism, you know, they, they say it's it's made of craving and aversion. And the the biggest craving, the b- biggest wanting is um, to just exist. You know, it's a feeling that if we don't engage in these patterns, then we'll somehow die or cease to exist or, you know, but it's at the root of it, the pattern is really just worried about its own survival. You know, because as you said, it's not about the physical organism. You know, like we had enough food. We had, you know, we're not in a a third world country or, you know, we're not um, struggling for actual existence. So what it is that is really, you know, what we're afraid of is is the, the death of the pattern of the ego itself. Hmm. So what would you say actually broke you out of the pattern? Was there like an aha moment or was it a gradual process? Hmm. Yeah, I would say both. There were a number of aha moments, but also I would say that like the biggest teacher for me was actually the suffering that I went through as a result of being sick and um, just literally my my body was was not tolerating what i was doing in my life so you know it wasn't tolerating the way i was trying to feed it it wasn't tolerating um you know just the work i was doing energetically it was it was just draining me so so i would say like my body made the decision for me and even though my mind i would i would try and go back to doing the the pattern I would just get hammered over and over by my body. And so uh, what would happen then physically? What were you experiencing? So, um, well, physically, um, there were a number of things. Like it, it was an autoimmune disorder. So at that time, um, I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, um, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, there, I had a lot of different um, sort of intolerances to food that sort of manifested as well. So so when I was out of alignment, which was most of the time back then, the, the body would, um, you know, it would cease to digest my food. Um, I, my blood sugar w- was a huge issue. It took a long time to really get that under control. So a lot of the time I had very high blood sugar and it's it's a state of constant agitation. Like it feels like you're you're boiling basically, and and the rheumatoid arthritis was um, just like a deep, um, deep deep pain. Can, like I got to a point where I literally couldn't lift a plate. My, there was so much pain. Um, so that for me, that the the suffering um, that I went through with that. Um, was it was an incredible teacher because it taught me to let go at a certain point, like just getting through a day to be able to feed myself and and go for a walk was all I could do. So um, so there had to be this sort of acceptance inside. I could either fight it, you know, mentally curse what was happening, or you know, and resist, or I could learn to surrender inside and that process of having to surrender, you know, like for me, it was like, I I talk about that period, you know, that sickness as a gift, because if not for that, I would never have shifted out of my patterns. So, you know, I I created a little um, animation called the the gift of death. And, uh, you know, and it really being, being, faced with what I, at the time I really felt was my, my imminent death. Really, it just forced me to come into the moment. And, um, you know, it was, it was truly a gift because it, it, you know, I would have never 
shifted on my own. I just didn't have the insight or the wisdom to be able to recognize the patterns that were running inside of me. So something in me, you know, you, you could call it my spirit or my, you know, just the, the body's wisdom, you know, shifted me out of that. And for me, that was my teacher at that time. And, um, and that led me to meditation as well. Um, you know, just because part of my, my problem at the time was my, my mind was just insane. It was pathological. And, you know, my only real motivation at the time was to find the off button and just to be able to get some sleep. That was my motivation. And uh, not, so I, I felt that meditation um, could be a vehicle for that. And as I got into it, I, I realized there's so much more. You know, it, it wasn't any great insight. It wasn't any capacity within me. It was actually this condition that actually created a, a state of suffering and that having no choice but to surrender. That was my path at that time. Yeah, there were a couple of things that you said that really stood out. It was when you said, let go and then mm -hmm. surrender. Because I think there's people who are listening that, well, the first, the first thought that crossed my mind was, so do you have to go through this life and death struggle <laughs> mm -hmm. in order to get to this point where you move past your patterns and express your brilliance? And then the other thing, though, was like the importance of the letting go and the surrendering, because it's like your path was similar to mine in that I, it had to take like a health crisis or actually several of them for me before I finally let go and surrendered. Um, yeah, I was struggling with the work and then I would have, uh, I think the first thing was I got in a car accident and then I had really uh, horrible pain that could last for, you know, a couple of weeks at a time. And there were times, that's how I could relate to when you were saying about uh, the, just trying to get through the day and like just to do anything just to survive the day. Cause I couldn't even lie down. Like it was painful in whatever position I was in. It was just to try to find the least painful position and hold myself there and just be in that space. Mm -hmm. And I also had like, you know, I got better from that, but just, I can think of another time too, where, the second time I had a major health crisis and I had some weird, I don't know what it was. I think it might've been West Nile or some sort of encephalitis where mm. the wow. meninges, the lining in my brain was swollen. And wow. I had, yeah, I couldn't even call it a headache. It was way beyond a headache and it lasted for 10 days and it was intolerable. Like a pillow mm. felt like a rock. I could mm. just chewing hurt because I can't even describe how painful it was. Um, but I got to the point, yeah, where I was wondering if I was dying when I had that. Mm -hmm. And then I got to a point where I just surrendered because there was nothing else I could do. I was like, just surrender, you know? It wasn't like a giving up. It's a giving up in that you're giving up control, but it's not like mm -hmm. a giving up like you're giving up on life. It's almost like yeah. I can't, yeah, I myself can't deal with this anymore. And I got to just let it go. Yeah. And yeah. When I did that, that's when I had the idea to put castor oil packs on my head. Like I remembered hearing about that and I started, I did that. And within 30 minutes, I started to feel relief. Wow. Yeah. But yeah. it was. So that was an intuition or. You... Yeah. It must've been some thing, mm. message from the universe, from my inner guidance, my soul, just saying, you know a way, there's some way that's right for this. So I'm not telling everyone, do not, you know, put castor oil packs on. If you have West Nile or encephalitis, I don't know. I never got it formally diagnosed. But that within the body, there's a knowing. And oftentimes you already know what can help you. And it's a matter of just listening and of letting go of the control. So it's not like you're thinking, thinking, what can I do to fix myself? It's like, I give up. I can't fix myself. 
And then that's kind of when the answer might come to you. Yeah. And that's, that's exactly what happened with me. It, I, for a long time, I was treating it like a problem to be solved with my mind. And um, so I was, I was going on the internet, finding diets and trying this and that. And I, I literally got to a point where I gave up. And it was at that point where I just, um, I started just doing a couple things that brought joy into my life. Mm. And, and part of my pattern was that um, I wasn't receiving joy. I was just caught in these patterns of working. And um, the metaphor with diabetes is you're, you literally can't receive the sweetness of life, you know, on, on a cellular level. Um, so for me, I was just going for walks in a, a beautiful um, provincial park that was nearby. And then I started working on music as well. And those two things they gave me a little spark of aliveness that wasn't in my life up to that point. I believe my healing really started when I started to feel that life and aliveness. I would 100% agree with that. So for those of you listening, you do not have to hit rock bottom in your health and wonder if you're dying. You just need to do something that breaks the pattern yeah. even just a little bit and something that gives you joy. My, my teacher um, who I, I work with on the path, um, he says that there are two ways on the path. And one, one way is the, the way of suffering. And the other one is the way of um, wisdom or, or gnosis. Mm -hmm. And so we can get hammered over and over like I did. You know, I was a slow learner. Um, yeah, me too. <laughs> or, or we can learn how it works and um, start to recognize the, the mechanism and how, um, you know, when we're experiencing pain. I love in, in Buddhism, they, they have this phrase, they, they say, pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. So that's part of the, the wisdom or gnosis is realizing we can never get to a point in our lives where we're pain free. Just by having a human body, we're going to experience pain and pleasure. But the suffering is the optional part. The suffering is when we resist what is. So if reality as it is in this moment is that I'm experiencing pain, when I mentally resist that or push it away, I'm compounding that pain. I'm multiplying it exponentially. And, and if you think about, you know, what really creates suffering, a lot of times, you know, if I think even, even simple things in my life, you know, doing my taxes, if I sit down to do my taxes, if I just do it, if I just sit down and do it, it's not that bad. You know, it's not, it's a bit painful, but, you know, but I can mentally resist it and procrastinate and defer it for weeks and, and it's that that creates the suffering, you know, and, it, and it's like that in the body. It's like that with pain. It's our idea around it. It's our concept. If we experience a pain, it may trigger fear. It may trigger all these, these deep unconscious worries and anxieties. And, um, you know, so a lot of it, it's, it's the mind, but it, a lot of it is unconscious. So a big part of my journey was to penetrate into those unconscious patterns and start to bring light to what was going on in the mind. Um, because if we just stay at the surface, you know, we just, our, our pain or whatever it is we're, we're experiencing as resistance, it may seem just like this wall, just like this solidified thing called pain. But if we penetrate into it, um, we can start to see that there's there there are more subtle layers and there's there's more going on inside um so the the journey for me has been to um it hasn't hasn't even been you know i i can't say there's really been any particular doing involved with this process of freeing my myself from myself I would say the whole process has been a recognizing of what 
the mind was already doing and learning to make those processes conscious. And then once they're conscious, then they become a, a choice. You can choose to drop them. But until they're conscious, um, you, you can't. You don't even know. You know we, d- we just don't know what we don't know until yeah. we penetrate. So it's like having, first you have to have an awareness that you're doing this. Yes. And it's not just, like for me, it's not just, oh yeah, I do this, and then you kind of forget that you had that realization. It's like kind of like watching yourself. So the awareness doesn't necessarily mean that you stop doing it, but that you do something, and then while you're doing it, at some point you have the realization that you're doing it again. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's almost like sometimes you act unconsciously. And I would say, you know, just to let people know, I mean, that happens to me all the time still. Like, would you say that still happens to you, Dan? Oh, yeah. I, like, I'm, I fall down all the time. My practice is to be aware of myself and be aware of what I'm doing. But, um, you know, this, this is really why I, it's so important to have people in your life around you who will tell you the truth about yourself. I find um, for me, you know, I have a few people who can see my own patterns better than I can see them myself. And um, I think um, for me, I've, I've been through this process so many times where I'll, I'll be, you know, creating films about samadhi. I'll be, you know, I, I know all this stuff, but there'll be something in my life where it's, it's a blind spot. It's unconscious. And even though I'm, I might be, you know, experiencing this, this union in my meditation, I may go into life and I'm, I just get sucked back into the same old pattern. Or it may be the same pattern, just at a higher level of vibration. You know, as we, as we unfold, I see it as almost like a spiral where we're, we're going around and around and we're growing, we're evolving, but it's like we we learn the same lessons over and over at different levels. Mm, Yeah. I have a friend who says the same thing. It's totally like you think you've peeled back all the layers and then you're doing like, you know, maybe somebody goes to a workshop and like, ah, I feel so, you know, light and transformed. And -hmm. then it comes back around again and they have to deal with it again. They're like this again. (laughs) Yeah. And, And this is the, the challenging thing. Like, you know, there's, there's so many, workshops and you know you you can do meditation retreats enlightenment intensives and all these different things people may go um, and work with a a teacher who you know and they they may in those experiences experience their their true nature they may have an awakening experience but you know it's so important to realize that um, that's not enlightenment you're just having an experience of your true nature doesn't mean that you're free. And um, I always distinguish between awakening and enlightenment. And, you know, awakening at, at any point in the journey, we can, we can have an awakening. We can just recognize our, our true self beyond name and form in any moment, um, regardless of how we've evolved. But to me, the enlightenment is, it's like the entire life journey, our, our whole evolutionary path. And ideally, we, what we want to do um, to become enlightened is we, we want to create a container to house that true nature permanently in a way that it can shine through the personality. And so that, what that means is, you know, literally growing in, in every way, like we grow, you know, we explore all the different facets of life. We, we learn to, you know, manage our relationships. We learn to, you know, create abundance in life. We, we start to explore the different facets of our being through maybe through art or through self-expression. And, you know, there are all these different facets of life and we explore them. We create this inner wiring but yet at the same time, what we're doing is if we're, if we're on the path, we're not 
creating a self structure around them. So, because if we just did that, you know, and we, we have all these different facets of our life, um, then our, our ego is just getting bigger and bigger. You know, there's just more of me to, <laughs> to create suffering ultimately as we grow on that, the, through the development process or the, the enlightenment process, we're simultaneously bringing awareness to those patterns and um, detaching because all of it is changing. All of this phenomena that constitutes us is changing. So if we're identified with any of it, um, then we're going to suffer when it changes because it will change. It, it's inevitable that it change so so that detachment you know and and that's like what what you were talking about earlier with the um surrender you know it's a deep inner surrender that has to happen and and detachment doesn't mean that you you are detaching from life in a way that you know you're you're aloof or not connected to me it's you're you're energetically letting go so that your energy isn't flowing in the condition patterns. And that energy is actually available to experience life fully. So strangely, you know, people, people think about Buddhism and, and this sort of detachment. And, and it's, it seems, you know, people who don't know it or understand it, they think it's kind of anti-life. You know, it's, it's not um, uh, life-affirming, but it actually is life affirming it is life itself it is the you know to be able to let go of that that contraction that resistance inside and free that energy actually creates the optimal sort of antenna out of your body um, to to experience life fully to have complete experiences yeah i love how you express that especially about living life fully because I did do an episode on three myths of enlightenment. And I like how you distinguish between awakening and enlightenment. Because sometimes people think that somehow enlightenment is this awakening. It's like, boom, you know? <laughs> Yay, I'm enlightened, right? But it's, yeah. it's like, and I like how you call it, it's a process. Because it's all part of a journey. And it's about living life fully, but without that yeah that ego constraint just allowing that life to come through you and living like with consciousness and like really being present and experiencing these moments that life has for you and i think another thing i want to mention too is sometimes people uh feel like that they're not good enough to be enlightened and mm -hmm. that's yeah, that's the ego. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you want to, you, you have more to share on that too? Yeah, yeah. I think um, that, that's a great point that um, this imminent self, you know, the imminent I that is beyond the conditioned structure, it is all the great teachers have said it's eternal. It has no need. It's, it's perfectly what it is. So it doesn't, it doesn't need to acquire anything, attain anything. It just is. It's pure being. And, and that is the truth of what we are at any moment, if we can recognize that. Or even saying, if, if I can recognize that, is not quite right. It's like <laughs> it recognizes itself. You know, it's like it just sort of wakes up to itself. It's like, oh, yeah, I'm not this body. I'm not the content of my mind. Um, and so, so that is, you know, it's, it's perfect and eternal and there's, there's, there's nothing to gain. There's, there's no striving. It's not about self-improvement. You know, the self that improves is the conditioned self, you know? And so, so the development process, the enlightenment process is simultaneously, you know, an adding to yourself. It is a sort of self-improvement but you're cleaning that self. You're cleaning it of the, um, you know, in, in Buddhism, you, they talk about sankharas, which are, um, they, it's a Sanskrit word, which means um, something like identified conditioned patterns. And that's really what 
causes suffering. So it's simultaneously this process of, you know, exploring life. And I see it as, as like a, an endlessly unfolding lotus, you know, which is the, uh, you know, the, the ancient yogic tradition. They, they actually use the symbol of the thousand petaled lotus, which is this endlessly unfolding self-structure. And um, so I think, you know, that is ongoing. And if we think we've reached some point where there's, you know, there's some I that is enlightened, then, you know, we can be pretty sure we're deluded at that point. (laughs) Yeah. One thing I want to point out too, um, when you mentioned like the realization that, you know, you're not the contents of your thoughts and you're not your body, but you are not but you are also you know yes you're not your thoughts you're not your body but you also are your thoughts and you are your body yeah and this is that's such a a subtle distinction because i i think um there's a a great way of describing it it actually comes from the yoga sutras um the patanjali's um yoga sutras and it's the very first phrase that he speaks about. And again, it's, it's Sanskrit words, but it's, it's brilliant. Sometimes these words have, um, you know, we, we just don't have equivalents anymore in our own language to make these, these fine distinctions or s- subtle distinctions. So what he says is um, yoga, chitta, vritti, naroda, which um, means yoga, which means union or ultimately samadhi it's it's um you know yoga is union with yourself or your with the source um so yoga chitta chitta means mind or mind stuff um and vritti is a neat word it means sort of like whirlpool or entanglement and then naroda is it it means cessation so what that all means is that to have union, to be in samadhi, there is a cessation of the entanglement or that spiral or whirlpool, whereby our consciousness gets lost with the phenomena of the mind. So, so we lose ourselves. It's not about you know, not being in the body. You know, the problem is we're identified with the body. The problem is we, there's this illusion that, that there's this, this me that is the body. And, you know, the paradox always is, you know, when I disentangle my primordial consciousness from the mind and senses, uh, then the energy is free and we're just in the body and the body is is alive it's like an antenna and so paradoxically like you experience the full experience of being in your body when you disentangle your you know that identification with the body so it's it's always it's always this paradox it's always um you know like whatever whatever the mind thinks it knows about this this process um it's always off base because it, you know, if it thinks it knows, like the mind is what has to die and surrender in order for that aliveness and awakening to happen. Because, you know, if all it is, is it's a collection of neural pathways and neurotransmitters. So if the energy is running in there, then you don't have the energy for your experience of of this moment in, in the now. That distinction is key. It's not about transcending the body. It's not about, um, you know, realizing some other me that is beyond the body. It is literally waking up within the body, um, but it's, it's an undescribable knowingness and, and fulfillment within the body, but there's, there's nothing to it. Like there's nothing, there's no quality to it. It's not contingent on any external phenomena. It's, and, and it's absolutely utterly empty, but at the same time full. 
which to the mind is is totally absurd. But you know, the 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 meditation will take you there. It will take you beyond the mind to this this sort of collapse of duality. And it's in that collapse of duality where the energy is is no longer you know, playing this game of, of good and bad, uh, this and that, self and other, you know, conscious and unconscious, you know, it's, it's self-arising and self-illuminating in that state. What would you say to people, because I know the ego is going to be triggered a lot by what we talked about in this episode, so when the ego kicks in and then, you know, it tries to preserve itself by uh, creating fear. So the fear that if I am enlightened, do I have to cast away everything that I am? You know, okay, yeah, I get to keep my body now, but do I have to cast aside everything that I think and become like this total blank slate? What would you say to that? Yeah, it's tricky because the mind you know, like to me, you're, you're not losing anything except for your delusions. So you're not, you, you know, like you can't, if you think about how the mind works, you know, like if you learn a language, you can't unlearn a language. It's, it's wired in, you know. So it's the same with our, our self-structure. Like you're, you're not going to disappear. You know, you can't unlearn. I can't unlearn Dan, you know, I, I, so, so it's, it's always there. So it's this, what you're, what you're recognizing is other dimensions of you. So um, actually in, in, um, you know, the, the Upanishads in the, um, the Vedic tradition, they, they distinguish these, these different levels of self. So they distinguish five levels of self and, on the planet today, almost everyone on the planet is living only on two levels. So our, our entire reality is on the mental and physical levels. And um, the other three levels are the, um, there's the energetic or pranic level. And then there's the vinyana, which is um, like, you could think of it as like the higher mind or big mind level. And then there's um, kind of what I was talking about earlier about the emptiness and fullness experience, the non-dual experience where, where this distinction between emptiness and fullness drops away. And that is the, um, they call it the Ananda level, the fulfillment level. Um, so, so these, these are all levels of being that are, clear and distinct and um, they're not even on the radar of, of most people. So to me, it's, it's, um, you know, you don't lose anything. It's not, you know, people think, Oh, I have to, I have to surrender myself and, and jump into some, some crazy, you know, idea that I have in my head about what enlightenment is. Any concept in the mind is not it. Because it's, it's truly, I sometimes say, like, samadhi is taking a leap into the unknown. And you literally can't know. You know, the mind that wants to know is just that, it's just one of those levels. It's just this, this mental level that has certain capacities. And in this development process, the most important thing for the mind to do is to simply recognize its own limitations. Mm, that's really powerful because it takes away a lot of the struggle and fear. And I think it makes it in some ways easier for people because it's not, yeah, it's not something you have to do. It's not like you cast out your whole personality and you become some person who sits on a mountain and goes um all the time <laughs> no no and like for some people like their path may draw them to mm -hmm. meditation but the the development process you literally it it's not separate from your life it is your life it you know like if you it's the, the beautiful thing about it is whatever's firing you up inside whatever's creating that inner aliveness 
is what you need to explore. So, so it's not like you need to give up the things that, you know, are, are bringing joy to your life. Those are the things that are your, your teacher that are meant to be experienced. So to me, it's, you know, the, the yogi on the mountain, you know, that's, that's an archetype. That's, you know, there, there may be some people who, you know, whatever their, their soul is here to do, you know, that may be the archetype that has to play out in their lives, but there are countless archetypes, you know? So for me, my, one of the things that is on my path is, is exploring consciousness and meditation. And, you know, that at this point in my journey is, I'm not saying it's for everyone. Sometimes you can, you can, you know, there, there are many different paths. There are, you know, in the yoga systems, there's the devotional path. Um, there's the, or there's the, the karma path where you do um, selfless service. You know, you, you move beyond the self in different ways. So you can, you can do it on the cushion. You know, you can, you can do it um, just by observing your life patterns or, or you can use these different yogic traditions um you know bhakti yoga is is the um you know the devotional where where you surrender the self to something higher and there are different practices in that so there there are in, infinite paths you know or mantra you know people people do chanting or um you know there, there, there are an infinite number of techniques and practices but what they all have in common is at a certain point you let go. Um, like if you, if you take these practices to their maximum, like you really go all the way with them, um, then, you know, it's like you, you become the mantra you become, you know, if you're doing meditation, you're observing the breath, you become the breath, literally the, the self that you are, dissolves or merges with the breath so there there's no more breather and breathed you know and and um and it's the same in in you know these devotional practices you you get to a point where you literally are not feeling inside that you are separate from another you know or in yoga like you become one with the yoga posture and and that is samadhi samadhi is union it's just you know in zen they they say you know if you're eating you just eat if you're walking just walk if you're sitting just sit so you you become one with the sitting you become one with the walking so the, you know the the problem you know if you want to call it a problem in you know society is that we're we're divided we're 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 not just eating you know we're not just sitting we're we've got all this activity in the mind and um most of it unconscious so we're not fully present in what we're doing yeah so one thing i want to add to you is because you spoke a lot about uh the different devotional practices which i think for some people might make them think again that they have to you know, be the, you know, sit under the tree. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but the universe is so expansive that it wants to express itself through you. But there are so, it's like, as you did say, it's like infinite in the ways that it can be expressed. So for some people, it may be, yes, yeah, sitting on a mountain and meditating. And for others, like it's that full appreciation of, being so i think something that people might be able to relate to is like if they uh yeah like you were saying walking going for a walk through nature and just being in there and enjoying it versus you know thinking about all the stuff you got to do when you get up you know if you don't finish your walk but you're just there or mm -hmm. even just uh sometimes people get into that kind of state when they're doing something like they're running or uh cycling or snowboarding mm -hmm. yeah yeah or even having a conversation yeah know? or cooking people get into yeah. that state with cooking with mm -hmm. art with 
uh, yeah, like with conversation, with spending time with their kids, like being there, a hug even. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's having a complete experience of what it, whatever it is you're, you're doing. And, you know, I think the, like the sankaras that I, I was talking about, the conditioned habit patterns that we develop come into being as a result of not having a complete experience. So if you if you think about um, you know something you don't want happening, some you know something happens, you injure yourself or whatever it is. There's a contraction. There's a pushing away, and and energetically you don't experience that thing fully. And you know we we do all kinds of things in life to distract us from the things we don't like. So. You know, if we're if we're in pain, or you know, somebody somebody did something to us, and we're, we we have an emotional pain, you know, we'll numb ourselves. We'll we'll watch Netflix. We'll drink. We'll do drugs. Whatever it is, to to not feel that experience fully, and and when we do that, it goes deeper into the unconscious, and we we haven't um, gotten rid of it it will just keep coming back. And these are the sankharas of, um, you know, either craving or aversion that, um, you know, they, they govern our lives. They become sublimated to different aspects of our life. So, you know, if we, we have something like that that happens in our childhood, um, it, you know, it may, may be something with, with, you know, my mother happened and then that starts to play out in all the relationships that I have with women through my life. And until I get to the root of the, the Sankara and free that energetically, it just continues to play out unconsciously. And we manifest the same situations over and over. Yeah, something that came to mind when you talked about uh, people numbing themselves by doing something, like choosing things to numb themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, what came to mind was eating, because eating is a perfect example of how like it's not about not doing things like going, oh, this is bad, too much drinking. Yeah. Like eating itself, you can be fully present, eating and tasting and smelling and enjoying the food. And yeah. then that is that moment of connection. Or mm -hmm. people can also eat to try to numb things out. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. So it's whether you're doing it consciously or unconsciously. And so, you know, if you're eating, who is eating? You know, is there like a little boss inside of you that is just craving the food or are you eating it consciously? And, and eating consciously is an incredible practice. If we can, we can actually feel beyond the mind and senses to the food itself as you know on the pranic level what what is that food actually doing in our body you know how is it how is it moving how is it how is the body responding to it and if we can eat on that level it's it's a whole different um dimension of of being you know um so so yeah i think anything it's not it's not so much what you do it's it's your attachment to what you do or or it's you know who is doing it is it, is it this little robotic part of you doing it or is the the higher self choosing consciously to engage in in whatever it is you're doing hmm. that's um i think this is a good segue for you to share more about samadhi because you've mentioned the phrase a few times throughout our discussion and people may not be familiar with it i know mm -hmm. a lot of people who follow you are you know obviously very familiar with it but for people that this is new to can you tell us more about it samadhi is an ancient sanskrit word it's common to many traditions and um we don't have any equivalent for it in, in our language today, in the English language. So if you, if you look at the ancient traditions in Buddhism, uh, it's an eight-part system, the Noble Eightfold Path. 
Um, so samadhi is the eighth part of the Eightfold Path. It's really the, the purpose of the Eightfold Path is to realize samadhi. In uh, the yogic systems, teachings of Patanjali, um, there's the eight limbs of yoga. The eighth limb of yoga is samadhi. So it's the, you could say the goal of yoga. It's the goal of all spiritual pursuit is to realize a union with something greater than ourselves. And, um, you know, we may conceptually have an idea of what that is, but the mind literally can't fathom it because the mind is what needs to stop in, in either, either in meditation or in absolute presence, as we des described, you know, with whatever it is you're doing, if you can come into absolute presence, um, that is samadhi. So, you know, really what's missing in our world today, you know, we, we for mo most people, you know, in my films, I talked about um, how we're, you know, it's like we're in the matrix. We're, we're in, you know, these, these patterns, you know, a lot of people are putting huge energy into acquiring things or, or, you know, getting money or self-improvement and you know, whatever, whatever the activities of the self are. And, you know, it doesn't matter. It's whatever patterns are running. Um, if this is creating suffering, and for most people it is creating suffering because of identification with, with the self-structure, then um, there's a way to come out of that suffering a way to recognize that part of you, that eternal part of you, you know, it was there when you were a little kid shining through your eyes, you know, it, it'll be there when, when you're old and about to die or, you know, it's, it's, it was there before you were born. Um, and it's that part of us that we can recognize. And if we, you know, there's, there's everything in the world that is changing. And then there's that which doesn't change. And so we can start to recognize or that part of us can start to recognize itself. And so um, these systems that um, have been used for thousands of years, some of these systems are, are um, you know, 4,000 years old. And um, they have... A process they have techniques um, that can be used, and the techniques are like stepping stones so so what we can do is um, you know our mind we start out with a busy mind and and we start to use these techniques, and so we give the mind something to do which is less busy and and then we move to another technique that is subtler and then subtler and subtler. So um, in, in the Vedic tradition, they, they say, you know, the technique is like a thorn to remove a thorn. Like ultimately, we want to let go of all doing, all techniques to realize our stillness. And um, it's in that, that deepest stillness that the self wakes up. There's an actual something that happens in that stillness, but it's it's not a it's not really a thing and it's not really a happening <laughs> <laughs> but it but there's a stopping of all of this mind activity and there's there's an illumination that happens so so meditation is is one way that's what I teach at at the Samadhi center and um you know if you can can um sit in, in meditation and gradually allow yourself to, you know, whether it's using techniques um, or we, we also teach self-inquiry to just observe the, the activities of the mind. And um, through those, those processes, we, we um, come to stillness. You know, in Zen, they say it's letting your mud settle. So it's, a, and it is a process. It takes time for that to happen. You have to go through different stages and there are many different stages of um, meditative absorption 
where it's like a part of the mind's activity will drop. And, and each time a part of the mind drops away, uh, we, we experience um, like an, an increase of energy and an increase of presence as well. So, um, so as we go through the process of meditation, um, you know, in, in the yogic teachings, they call it dhyana. There's, there's, um, there's dharana and dhyana. Dharana is, is single-pointed focus. Um, so part of meditation is single-pointedly just being in the moment. So there's, there's like this aspect of effort to it. Um, and that's the yang aspect of meditation. It's like I, I have this intention to show up in this moment, to be here and, and um, to, to bring my awareness to what is. And then um, dhyana is the feminine component. It's the surrender component. So there's, there's like an allowing of whatever it is in the moment to just be as it is. And so we, we learn to identify inside ourselves um, the resistance that we have. If anybody has, has tried meditation, you know, if you sit long enough, you come face to face with all of your deepest patterns. You'll, you know, after, after an hour or two, you'll become uncomfortable. You'll, you'll start, you know, trying to escape from little pains that are coming or, um, you know, the mind will start to generate all kinds of thoughts or diversions and, um, or there might be sleepiness, all kinds of hindrances will come. So the, the process is to stay fully present and, and at the same time fully surrender to whatever phenomena is arising. And, um, and that's, that same approach can be applied to life as well. In any, any situation that we're in, you know, this, this process of, of being fully there, fully present, and energetically surrendering or opening to whatever that experience is. And, um, you know, that doesn't mean that we, you know, if, if somebody, you know, one thing people will object to when I say this is, um, you know, people will say, well, you know, like what if somebody, you know, really is, is pissing me off or, or, you know, I, somebody steals my parking spot in the, you know, in, in at the grocery store or whatever, am I supposed to just be a pacifist and, and just let everything happen? And, you know, that's, that, or, you know, we're on a, a larger level, you know, say there are terrorists in the world doing terrible things. Am I supposed to just surrender and allow that to happen? And um, that's not what I'm talking about. That's, I'm talking about an energetic inner surrender so that you're in the moment, whatever's happening, if there's, there's uh, you know, a, a terrorist attack happening, it doesn't mean you condone that, you know, or somebody does something bad, it doesn't mean you condone it, but you, you drop the unconscious inner conditioning, you know, the habit pattern that is within you surrounding that thing. So that in that moment, you're actually free to choose. So you're not just reacting to that thing. You're not just unconsciously doing something out of your own conditioning. So you're, you're free to choose. So if somebody in that moment, you know, somebody pisses you off in the, the parking lot, um, whether you, you know, give them a good talking to or punch them in the nose, whatever, it, it, you know, in that moment, you're not doing it out of, out of, um, you know, a, a reaction, you're, you're free to choose. And, and that's the key. That's what we're talking about. It's, it's an equanimity within you where you're actually free to consciously choose every moment. Um, and, you know, so for, for the world, for, for um, you know, these big problems in the world, you know, the, the problems perpetuate themselves when we're just constantly reacting it's so like one side will do something, the other side will react. But if we can 
skillfully be, you know, turn that moment into art, like turn it into aliveness and awareness and let, let the higher self guide the action. You know, then, then, um, you know, it, we, we don't know what could happen. You know, it's outside of the pattern. It's outside of the conditioning. We don't know what a world would look like, you know, where, where people are doing that, where, where, you know, countries are doing that. And um, to me, that would be exciting to, to find a different way of being on this planet, a different way of interacting with the world in this moment. Yeah, that's really powerful. And it may be that, you know, when you're really aligned and tuning into your higher self, you may react the same way that you would have if you were just reacting. Yeah, exactly. So like you may in, choose to act <laughs> yeah, a certain way. May, yeah, like in if you read the, the Bhagavad Gita, there are these metaphors and, and parables about um, war and fighting. And, uh, you know, it doesn't mean that you don't engage in the world and it's who is engaging in the world. You know, is it this little me, this little fearful me reacting and trying to control and trying to fight? Or, you know, there, there's another way of, of fighting that is, you know, in martial arts, there's the dance, right? There's the going into battle, you know, the samurai going into battle already dead, you know, if we go into life already dead, like dead to our limited self, then it becomes a dance, then it becomes art, then it becomes this play of form. And that is, you know, the, the higher self, the ancient traditions talked about the game of Leela, the game that the gods play. And, you know, that is what is possible on that level is... Um, you know, to play with form, to play with whatever it is that we're being directed by that aliveness that inside of us, or, you know, you could say directed by our, our spirit or our soul. Yeah. Do. Yeah. Cause the aliveness is not going to direct us to contraction. No, no. And it's, it's, um, you know, to me, I, I love the, idea that we we are like an antenna you know most of the time our antenna is broadcasting it's just broadcasting an ego but when we when we free that energy the antenna literally becomes a receiver and you know that energy inside of us can literally touch the higher worlds and and we start to think akashically it's like we become a node in the higher mind. So, so when we're being lived by that higher mind, um, you know, we, from the, the limited self's perspective, it's, it is scary. Like you're, you're giving up control, but over time, you the limited mind will start to realize, wow, this is, this is amazing. Like this, you know, what the synchronicity and the, you know, whatever is unfolding from, from my surrender is so much more than what I could have generated on my own. So, so now maybe I'll get online with this process and, and um, just go with it, even though I really, I really don't know, you know, what's going to happen. I don't know, you know, I can't see in advance, but I know that when I, when I surrender inside and connect to the big network, then it's amazing. It's, it's poetry. Yeah, I would have to say like, that kind of describes my uh, personal journey or life story where you don't know what would happen, like in terms of the bigger picture, like the world events going on and the politics and the climate. What happens when we, you know, more and more of us surrender and, and are that antennae to, you know, receive and act from that higher consciousness versus the little reactionary self but mm -hmm. just speaking from my own personal life experience like when i surrender and i just step aside let the mind step aside and just allow you know what's going to happen and to make choices from 
like a more conscious perspective, uh, everything has changed for me. Like, I, you can't even say a 180. It's so, my life is so different now than when it was when we were living together, you know? It yeah. seemed like there were so few options available back then. Like, mm -hmm. you know, only so many things I could do to survive, right? Yeah. And, and only these types of people around me. And I remember being angry and judgmental of others. And I wasn't going to mention this. It came up before, but I'm going to mention it because I think people need to see how uh, that like we're, we're real people, you know, we're not trying to be like um, guru, right? Like we have all the same thoughts and nastiness has crossed through our minds as everyone else. Yeah. But to accept that. That part of me, you know, like that Dan structure, you know, there it's, it's like, you know, little, little, it's, it's like, um, what do you call it? Like an inner dialogue that, that is running, you know, mm -hmm. judge, judging people and um and that you know it 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 hasn't gone away for me yeah. <laughs> it's still there but it, it becomes less you know it the more i you know i just sort of watch it sometimes like i'll i'll be you know if somebody does something stupid in traffic you know there there there's a part of my mind it will generate like some sort of insult you know but mm -hmm not as strong as it used to be it's it's more you know sometimes it's just like a whisper but it's still there and and it's like these things you know that wiring we we um you know you can't get rid of that wiring you can't you know and it's it's not desirable to get rid of our wiring because that is how we interface with the world so you know sometimes having having some sort of a, a response is is what needs to happen in the moment. So you're not, you're not killing part of your brain through this process, but over time, the, the charge around it, the identification with it is, is what lessens and until eventually, you know, ideally the brain is just sort of sitting there like a tool, just ready to be used. And it's not in the driver's seat, you know, it becomes um, the, the servant and, and not the master. And, and that is, you know, when, when you reach that point, that's enlightenment, you know, it's, I'm not there yet. Yeah. But paradoxically, it's the journey though. That's the enlightenment and that you're always going through the spiral of another layer where you are aware of yeah the, the pattern and, you know, the reaction, and then you go around the spiral again and, you know, your mind, like it's maybe it starts off at 1% where the mind can set itself aside at 1%. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to use well, numbers and stuff because, you know, it's what our programming is, right? Yeah. But over time, it starts to shift. The balance shifts where more and more the mind is less in the driver's seat and more just there in that supporting role or, you know, part of the cast, right? And yeah. then that's when things start to, shifting but even at one percent things can shift for people and do you ever get to a hundred percent i don't know i'm not there yet but that's okay mm -hmm. exactly exactly even you know even the the greatest meditators of all time you know like the there was a study done with the dalai lama on you know this this group of lamas who had a minimum of ten thousand hours of meditation and um they studied the the startle response in in these guys, and normally that's considered something that is, um, you know, even even a little baby when they're born they have this startle response. And scientifically, they thought, you know, that was something that couldn't be um, touched by meditation. But these guys, they would make a loud noise, and energetically it would just pass through them but they still even even the greatest meditators there was still a small reaction it was never a hundred percent you know it wasn't like they completely formatted their their reptilian brain they there was always some small percentage of of reaction so so it's a good question you know is there any end point is there a point where um 
you know, there you're literally just in a state where energetically nothing is getting snagged, you know, like there, there's no, if it were a river, then, you know, the energy is just moving down the river and there are no obstacles and, and that, I, I don't know. I have no idea if, because, you know, if there is an, an actual endpoint, you know, the, um, the traditions say that there is something called Sahaja Samadhi, which is, um, they, they describe it as the drop returning to the ocean. There's a point in the journey where the mind activity somehow sinks into the heart or, or dissolves into the heart. And um, the really big guys, you know, the spiritual masters in, in history, you know, that, that is the state. Like we're talking about the Jesus and the Buddha and, you know, um, very rare individuals in, in which this um, has happened. Um, so, um, you know, but, um, you know, but like you said, you know, if like for, for your average person, you know, just doing five minutes of meditation a day, just, just doing, you know, enough to, to start to go in the direction of less suffering is it can make a monumental, um, difference in life and and it's not about achieving some end point or or goal you know like that one of one of the biggest paradoxes on the on the journey is you know we, we can't try to make something happen we can't have an agenda because again that is the mind appropriating the journey so it's you know the more we we want enlightenment or desire it the farther away we we actually get from it. So it's, again, just starting to learn to recognize the limitations of the mind and, um, you know, recognizing whether the mind is um, appropriating the journey, you know, the, whether the mind has some agenda or some I idea, you know, that I want to be enlightened, you know, there's, there's some I that is going to achieve something. Um, because, you know, ultimately it's not, you know, there, I love um, the Suzuki Roshi said, um, you know, there are no enlightened people, strictly speaking, there are no enlightened people. Um, there are only enlightened activities. Um, and I, I love that. I think that that really um, cuts to the heart of what this is all about. You know, there's no there's no ego or self structure that ever becomes enlightened. All, all it is is um, there, there's an opening. You know, there's there's a there's a connection that is made, whereby we we become an instrument, and and that enlightened action is when there's no me involved in the action. Really, really well said, Dan. So I want to ask you, um, you know, now that you've shared more about Samadhi, can you tell us more about your films, like your Samadhi film, uh, and also what's coming up? Sure. Well, we have a, a trailer coming out um, for a film called The Path. And um, the, uh, the tagline for it is From Dust to Divinity. From Dust to Divinity. And... Um, the, so the path is each of us, and uh, and it's really a, a film about the development process um, that we we go through. Um, the last two films, um, the Samadhi films. The first one was was um, about Maya and the illusion, the matrix that that um, we find ourselves in. So it, it was sort of exploring sort of why. Samadhi is important, you know, and uh, the second one was exploring what Samadhi is using various analogies. And um, this, this next film will be more speaking about how we move through this development process, um, not only how we uh, realize Samadhi through meditation, but how we can 
um, start to integrate awareness into everyday life and and start to really delve into the conditioned patterns that um, that are um, shaping our, our lives and uh, to become free of those patterns. So will this one also be in parts, released in parts? Yes. Um, so my plan, which, which can always change, but at this point, um, I feel like um, there will be uh, various parts to the film. And um, my plan is to um, release those parts. So I, I'm not going to wait two years to release the whole film. I'm, I'm going to release each part as it's completed. Um, so the, the first um, part will be um, talking kind of about the, the big picture of the path, um, talking about the sort of the perennial teaching and, and what this path is from the perspective of, of the major traditions. And then we'll be going through each part or each level of self, which I actually mentioned earlier, you know, we're, we're on the, the, basically the mental and physical layers of, of our being. But um, what we'll be exploring in the film is um, firstly um, the energetic layer of our being, um, how we, we um, can um, become in contact with that layer and the different, um, how the dr different traditions have purified the self structure or, um, you know, through, through meditation or prayer um, and, uh, and really trying to get to the, the mechanism of how that works because um, that part of it actually is mechanical. There is a, there, there is a mechanics to the, the cleaning of that energy and the disentangling of that energy. Um, and then once we've, we've purified the vessel, we become like the antenna that is connecting to the, the higher realms, the higher mind. So that there, there will be a section speaking about what that is. And, um, and uh, there's, there's sort of an archetypal template um, that we'll be exploring as well. And, a lot of um, like Joseph Campbell, um, Carl Jung have, have really um, fleshed out that, that template. template. And um, so, so um, I'll be showing how that, that sort of archetypal journey plays into the whole uh, development process. And then finally, the, the last layer, the Ananda, you know, it's, it's sort of the the layer that is described by the, the saints and sages and, and mystics who have gone through that process of, of purification and freeing up from the, um, the archetypal level of identification as well. And I should mention all of these layers within the structure in the Upanishads, they have Sanskrit words for them, but the, the words all contain the word maya, so all of these levels of self are still within Maya. They're still within the illusion. So um, the film will be about always, you know, exploring these, these aspects of Maya with which we're entangled, but at the same time realizing that which is always already beyond. So when do you think the first one is going to be ready then? <laughs> I, I'm, I can't commit. <laughs> every, every time I've ever tried to commit or, or predict, I'm usually wrong. So, Okay. Uh, well, can we say less than two years for sure? <laughs> less, less than two years for sure. Yes. All right. Less than a year, possibly? Possibly, yes. Okay. So people have something to look forward to there. But in the yeah. meantime, though, they can still watch your other films. That's right. Yeah. And uh, the um, Awaken the World film channel on YouTube is where those films are found. Or you can, um, there is a, a website that um, is being constantly updated, um, but by the time this is out, it should be fully up. But that is awakentheworld.com. Okay, so people can find all of the previous films on awakentheworld.com. Also, um, there, there's a link to the Samadhi Center if you're interested in doing meditation, doing intensive meditation. It's kind of like doing 
surgery on on the self um, that we do here. So um, if anybody uh, is interested in doing a 10 day retreat and and really going deep into this process, um, they can find the link on there as well. And uh, yeah, and just all of our contact information is on there. Yeah, and I've been to the Samadhi Center. It's a beautiful place. So it's nestled in nature. There are these really impressive, are they pine trees? Yeah, it's like uh, old growth pine trees on the property. Yeah, you're really immersed in nature too and really wonderful accommodations and uh, wonderful kitchen and food too. So you're really looked after at the Samadhi Center. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a, a place to um, you know if you are interested in really going within, um, we'll support you on that journey. Um, actually, maybe you should spell samadhi just in case. Sure. Want to check it out? Sure. So that website is samadhi.ca. It's s a m a d h i dot c a. Okay, so that's where you can learn more about Dan and uh, delve into meditation deeper. You can watch the films on awakentheworld.com, and there's also a YouTube channel. And I think on that note, I just Mm -hmm. wanted to say, Dan, thank you again so much for joining us and sharing about Samadhi, sharing about your personal journey. I hope it inspires listeners to realize that potential that you have within And it's always there. It's just a matter of, you know, stepping outside of your mind a little bit and recognizing your patterns just to see that you are more than the ego and your body. Exactly. Yeah, thank you. Um, It's been a pleasure and I look forward to doing it again sometime. Yeah, for sure. We'll have you again on the show in an upcoming episode, maybe when you're part one of your next film is ready (laughs) sounds good yeah could be a year (laughs) could be a few months well i'm sure people will be eagerly anticipating it so just want to thank everyone for tuning in i'm holly your host thanks for listening and i look forward to reconnecting with you again soon